All right. Looks like we're live. Welcome to the show, everybody. This is the Elevating IT podcast recorded live with our special panel today, special guests. We have, I'm going to just introduce in the way I see it here, David Spire from Entech, Tim Gwim from PCH Technologies, Frank DiBenedetto <laughs> from Audit, as well as can't I can't fit it all in there, but Frank is also an MSP for owns Two River Technology Group, and uh, Brian Weibel from Infotech Solutions. Welcome everybody. Thank you. And here's what I'm going to do: is what I'd like to do is just go through each of you guys and have you introduce yourselves. Um, we've got people coming on, and what I'd like to do is, if anybody has questions as you're listening live just post a comment. We should be able to see the comments. I believe people are watching either on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. I don't think YouTube will show on the StreamYard comments. So we use a system called StreamYard. I can see your comments if you're on Facebook and LinkedIn, I think, but not on YouTube. So if you're watching on those, feel free to post a comment with your question that you want to ask the panel, and uh, I will moderate here. So why don't we go with um, in the order that I went, if you guys, I, I don't know if you guys see the screen the same way I see it, but David, why don't you go first? Sure. Uh, th Mike, thanks for having us today. Uh, my name is David Spire. I'm chief development officer here at Intech. So I'm in charge of uh, revenue generation and marketing. Um, we've been around for goodness, uh, 24 years now. Uh, Southwest Florida is our marketplace. So we've got offices uh, in Bradenton, Fort Myers and Naples. So we're on the West coast, uh, just below Tampa, um, about 80 staff. Uh, and you know, traditional managed service provider, managed cybersecurity. So that's our that's our sweet spot. Awesome, Tim. I'm Timothy Gwen, president of C and CEO of PCH Technologies. I've uh, been in business since 1997. Uh, we're based in the Philadelphia market. Our uh, office is in main headquarters in South Jersey, and we're about 27 employees. Um, a traditional MSP with a very strong focus uh, in cybersecurity. We focus on financial construction and manufacturers or the vertical industries we actually specialize in. And we really focus on having a very, um, making sure our clients are always up and running no matter the circumstance, whether that's a cyber issue or a storm that runs through here. Uh, so uh, looking forward to be on the, uh, the podcast today. Thank you, Frank. So I'm Frank DiBenedetto from uh, New Jersey, the MSP in Central Jersey called Two River Technology Group. About uh, 17 employees, been doing this for I think 18 years now. Um, Focus on cloud uh, services, cybersecurity, hosted voice over IP and managed networking services, uh, kind of like what most of us do. And I uh, found an audit uh, sales presentation system about five years ago out of a need um, to try to make uh, it easier to allow our prospects and customers to make good buying decisions. And, uh, you know, so that's basically um, what the goal was there. And that's what I do. Brian. Yeah, um, my name is Brian Weibel and I'm with Infotech Solutions. We're a uh, managed service firm out of Lafayette, Louisiana. We cover basically the whole southern part of the state uh, from Lake Charles, Louisiana, all the way over to New Orleans. Uh, we've been in business since 2004. I am currently the account executive, which uh, means that my responsibilities are for developing new business, but also uh, taking care of our current clients and making sure that they're satisfied with the services that we do provide for them. And, and uh, I think the biggest thing that we bring to our clients is to help them mitigate the risks that are out there related to cybersecurity. Awesome. Well, thanks, guys. And uh, we're going to start with a um, question about sales process. But before we start that, I want to make sure everybody understands that um, one thing you all have in common is you are all audit users. And of course, this podcast is sponsored by audit. But we're here to talk about sales. And, and because audit's a sales tool that you guys use, I'm sure it's going to come into that discussion. But really, the goal here is to talk about you know, what's happening in sales in your MSP, what you're doing, what you're seeing. So I wanted to kind of start with you, each one of you talking about your sales process, what it's like in your MSP. In other words, you know, who's doing the selling, who's doing the assessments, um, who else is involved in the process? Kind of give us a, each of you a, a high level view of, of what your sales process looks like. And, and we'll just go the same order. I think that's uh, start with David. All right. Well, this has been uh, what feels like a lifelong journey trying to figure this one out, right? Crack the code on, on how best to sell. 
Uh, and as we as we worked our way through the process over the years of uh, making that fatal mistake of hiring your first rail, sales rep, giving them a desk and some business cards and hoping for the best, um, which destroys uh, good salespeople, um, we've we've settled into a collaborative approach, right? And so we we believe very strongly in um, the somewhat SLI model of selling, which is account account ownership, right? So we have um, executive sponsors in our selling process. So. Uh, the sales rep's responsibility, as we like to say, is to uncover the opportunities and keep the deal on the rails. It's up to us as executive sponsors, whether it's myself, one of our general managers, um, my business partner, um, you know, to kind of help create the credibility. A lot of times they're wanting to have business, the, the prospects we're dealing with want to have business conversations. They want to understand mm -hmm. the PL aspect and what it's like to grow a business and the operational challenges and, and how we kind of play in that ecosystem for them. And so um, I'd say that the hardest thing that we have in our process is slowing the deal down enough to do it right. Like a lot of times what we're finding is prospects are like, I'll give you any information you want as long as you come back on Tuesday with a proposal. And that's just not our approach. Right. And I think that probably that's going to be echoed on this call. Uh, if that is your approach, you couldn't really use the, the audit platform successfully and effectively. Right. We've got to slow the deal down enough to gather enough information um, to tell a compelling story on, on how we can, um, make changes inside the organization. So um, we, we have a document that we share at the very beginning. We call it our focus document. So FOCUS is just an acronym for different steps in our sales process. So we've got a five step sales process that ultimately culminates with a proposal and a set of recommendations. Um, but as far as the, the teams involved, we do have engineers that we've certified on our audit process, not necessarily the audit tool, but how we gather the information to populate effect effectively. So it's it's been some work for us to get there, making sure that we got the right cogs in the in the machine to, to turn out good results uh, and slow down to speed up is our is our motto internally to, to get more deals done. Awesome. Tim. Yeah, so I would uh, it's been a process for us for you know sales and marketing. And you know, we we lived on for the first probably 19, 18 years just on referrals on good business. Past six or seven years, we've really gone all in on on sales and marketing uh, in order to, to build our business besides our referrals um, and kind of what we what we kind of settled in on. And, you know, the, I saw Frank actually at an ASCII event when he on the very beginning of the audit tool. And that kind of changed my whole mindset on, on, on how to sell. And we've been using it. Uh, ever since. So we start out with, you know, a discovery, you know, a, a 10 minute discovery call just to see kind of is this a fit for us or not? So we can get to a quick a quick temperature check if we're going to take because basically take this to the, to the next step and then get a technical you know assessment um, scheduled. And that's that's led by our client relationship manager and then also uh, a, a technical sales engineer also basically gets involved. They do the fact finding, get the information from from there. And we we kind of sell more of a, on a it's technology, but more from a, on a business perspective and talk about risk and cyber risk yeah. versus, you know, antivirus and different different technologies. We want to talk about how we're going to protect your business. Um, we talk about cyber liability insurance, too, is a big, a big part of what we're talking about. Um, so we'll get all that information together. We'll do uh, a presentation about what we kind of found. Uh, and then we'll also as part of that, we'll also present present the audit at that point in time. And from there, it's sometimes there's another one or two meetings to finalize. And then from there, we, uh, we, then we, we basically, you know, cl close the deal, but, and so we use, so that's our, that's our external selling process. We also have an internal selling process to our existing clients as well that we do. Uh, it depends on the client, but we go anywhere from a quarter to six months to a year, depending on the client. So that's a, another area of our sales tools. And we use audit okay. in both cases. Cool. Frank. Yeah, so we are very similar to what Tim's doing, um, where we we really focus on the process of gap selling, which is let's expose, um, let's show where the customer is today. Um, and, you know, I always kind of lead with that. I say, before I can propose anything to you, I need to understand where you're at today. But more importantly, you need to understand where you're at today. And I find like their hair is usually on fire. If I could take all that spaghetti that, you know, is in their head and, and put it, you know, in a, in a format where they can understand where they are today, and then and only then could we go to work and say, okay, here's a solution to your problems, not products and services, right? So, um, so we kind of follow that gap selling approach. Uh, we, we use a, a three meeting approach. Um, so we, we do the pre-qual um, first to make sure that it's a fit for our vertical, 
our size uh, geographically. Um, once we get through that, uh, we'll book the first appointment where we'll typically go on site um, with them. And, um, you know, we'll start to explain what our process is, which includes the um, uh, the, the discovery. Um, I do owner based selling, so I'm the, the main salesperson. So I can usually do that in that, that uh, first meeting. Um, in some cases, I will send uh, some of my other team members out and let them do uh, the data discovery if it's going to require like, a deeper dive. But I'll always focus on the business problems and I'll let somebody else do, you know, the, the more tech discovery. Uh, meeting number two is usually in our office. So I like to control the narrative and um, that's where we do the present the presentation of findings. So that's where I use the audit report and I'll present to them. Uh, we never give a proposal uh, to the, the prospect ever unless they're ready to sign. Um, probably about, I'd say, uh, maybe about 50, 50 not 30 to 50 percent of the uh, the prospects I can close in my office um, on that second meeting. The rest, um, uh, typically, we want to think about it, and that's okay too because they kind of I let that report sort of sink in and it festers a little bit. They talk to their current MSP or yell at them, and um, we'll before they leave, we'll schedule that third meeting, and that's where I will let the you know, decision making meeting. I make it very clear that we're going to have a meeting, and you're going to decide yes or no. We're not going to we're not going to chase each other for six months. So I try to uh, the you know the marketing, the pre qual, and then laying out that process usually um, allows us to get through that sales cycle on our our way and get to a, a yes no or, or or no not you know not now kind of answer um and that's that's the approach we follow i'll, I'll do that that third close meeting in their office make it easy for them um so they don't cancel on us but um that's kind of how we do end that and then um like tim said too uh we we have account managers internally and we'll uh do anywhere from quarterly to annually it depends on the size of the customer the mrr and we'll, we'll divide that out and we, we put them in different buckets and then we'll do business reviews to cross sell and upsell and we drive quite a bit of MRR that way as well. Cool. Ryan. Um, yeah, so I'm a little bit different. Um, I was brought on to kind of be a customer liaison. Our, our company traditionally has had techs that weren't really good at, at uh, being able to talk, you know, on a customer's level about their problems that we tended to basically just list the services that we had and the price that it was and and it wasn't very successful in doing it that way because we weren't uncovering any problems and understanding how they, you know, currently use technology. Um, and so our process is very similar to what everybody has had. I usually go in with a, a senior uh, engineer and I handle the questions about current technology and what they're looking to accomplish. And he does the assessment of the uh, hardware and some of their processes and services that they have in place. Uh, it was really a, a, a tough time for us uh, because we didn't really have a tool of being able to to put it in, in, in English, for lack of a better term. And so having audit to be able to go in and show that gap of here's where you're currently uh, sit with your technology and exposing the risk uh, for downtime or even uh, cybersecurity risk through audit has just created a, a much easier process to get to the close. And so we don't really use a proposal anymore uh, as well now that we use audit, but uh, it's about a three-step process. At the max. I would say normally when we lose, it's, it's unfortunately we, we lose to do nothing. We don't really lose to the competition. Awesome. And, you know, I know that this is a panel discussion. I'm kind of moderating it. You know, usually when me and Frank jump on these podcasts, he's kind of the co-host. So, Frank, if you have any follow up questions or if any of you guys have any thoughts that popped in your head as you're listening to the others speak, um, feel free to jump in and ask away. Yeah, I, I have one question kind of posed to Frank on his three I like the idea of bringing the, the prospect to the office. Um, we're finding that we're not doing, we're, we're going right on, on Zoom meetings versus coming in offices. Are you leveraging that at all? Are you, now that COVID's kind of over, are you back to do that office type of work? Because we're trying to do things more and more remotely without even sending technicians out to do some things. Yeah, it's a good question. So um, that's, how, that's how our process had started. And then when the pandemic happened, uh, you know, after maybe six months, we um, we had shifted to doing more of the PowerPoint slide deck and doing it via Zoom. 
Um, I would say we do more that way than than um, than in person. But if I can get them to come in person, I've always found that those results to be the best. Because I think um, for me, the discovery process and that presentation, those meetings are where you're really building the rapport and the relationship with the customer, right? And I always feel like that's really where the closing is happening. The, the actual signing of the proposal becomes a formality. I think when everything's in Zoom, it's just easier for people to check their email and sort of just like smile and, you know, nod their heads like we're all doing now. Um, so I, I, I try to push them back towards, you know, allowing us to come there and come on site if they're uncomfortable with it or every once in a while, you know, because we do a lot of cloud stuff geographically, you know, it's not practical. Um, then we'll go the Zoom route. But my preference is to try to get them in person. Yeah, yeah I, I definitely agree that getting them in person for that meeting where you're presenting your findings for the first time is really important. And we, we would bring larger clients back to our, our facility to show them that we're not a fly by night MSP, you know, to see our knock, they see, you know, our offices, they see everything together. So definitely that had credibility. So, but when the pandemic hit, you had to figure out, like you had to do Zoom and that kind of just, just stay kind of with stay the course. We haven't, we try to be getting person as many, as much as we can, but we, we just had a, a, one of our meet our client, one of our existing clients came and used our conference room and it was like our first visitor. And I, I don't know how long, um, but I don't get off tough topic, but um, no, I think definitely if you, we can get the person uh, in, in person, it's definitely a, a, a better way to build a relationship for sure. Yeah, totally. I did. I did find that, you know, we, we started getting a lot of referrals um, because we we went all in on, on a cloud solution 10 years ago after Hurricane Sandy. So we kind of because of our marketing and because we met with a lot of prospects over the years, uh, that's what we've been known for in this area. So. Um, we've been getting a lot of referrals from uh, prospects as MSPs have failed them because uh, it just, you know, they didn't have a good hybrid solution, right? And so they're coming to us. So the deck is a little bit loaded, I would say, now. So doing it via Zoom is, um, hasn't, um, it doesn't really hurt us the way I think it would have maybe three or four years ago. <clears throat> um, or not really hurt us, but, you know, like skewed the results in the wrong direction. Made it harder. Yeah, I made it harder. I think because they're so hyper focused on on solving the problem, and they they they're keen aware of of what the problems are. It makes my job easier. I just you know I can I can kind of say okay, you you know better where you are today than most people do. Here's the solution. And so if we do it via Zoom for them, it's like it gets to the end point faster, and they're like sign us up and getting. We, we get little to no price resistance at all, especially when, when people, you know, know where the problem is and know we can solve it. Cool. All right. So for the next question, I want to kind of, it's kind of an extension of the last one. You know, I want to kind of dive into the, the sales process and how you do things. And I thought the best way to do that is if each one of you had kind of a recent success story or kind of, you know, if you don't have a recent one, just, you know, your biggest success story and, Talk about what that is and, and how that kind of unfolded for you and start with David again. All right. Well, I'll lead off. Uh, the one that comes to the top of mind, I think everyone's a success story, Mike. Uh, <laughs> that's for sure. In this industry, um, we, we had one of our reps and when he first came on, with he's been with us about two and a half years. Uh, one of his targets was uh, the local Habitat for Humanity. And um, he had he had made, I think, I think the number was either 42 or 46 uh, reach outs to them and was getting nowhere, uh, ended up landing a meeting. And to, to Tim's point, a lot of the, the cyber um, risk was out there and we were able to go in I mean, again, use the audit report to demonstrate where they were at, where they needed to be. And timing was very favorable. One of the questions I had asked in our initial meeting was, have you received a checklist from your, your, carrier yet about, you know, the renewal and your, your posture. The guy's like, no. And I said, well, you'll probably get one later that day. He got it. The current provider fill it out. Right. There's blood all over the walls. And so um, you, you'd like to think that right place, right time. We got lucky, but we got lucky in two and a half years of trying. Right. So it's like you kind of make your own luck in that. And it was it was a huge win. And, and the ability to demonstrate literally where they were at and where they were going. Uh, it's it's rare, but, you know, they increased their spend by three X to do the right thing. Um, and it was all because we could we could show them show them what it could look like in so many ways. So that was that was a huge huge win for us. Cool, Tim. I'm gonna tell a little bit of a, a different story. Um, it's kind of sales. It is sales related. 
So there's a construction company about just a block down from our office. And we've been trying to get them for five, six years. We've been knocking on the doors, trying, trying to get everything squared away to get to get them as a client. It's a good, you know, a good kind, good prospect for us. So this goes to networking and kind of not, um, you know, we, we're, we're in those, we're in the construction field. We're in the manufacturer and the financial field. So I was at an event around, we have a holiday party, one of our uh, development council construction. And I just start talking to somebody, end up being an attorney. Attorneys are not in our, in our wheelhouse. So I still introduced myself. I talk what, I, what I'm, what I'm saying about, I'm Tim Gwim, PCA technology focused in cybersecurity. You know, I, I lead off with construction and this attorney actually specializes in construction. So it was a great, a great connection to start talking about it. Oh, and I know the CFO of this company. Um, she's, it's called, um, I don't say the name of the client, but it's right, it's right down. It's a, it's a client I was looking to get into. So immediately I connect up with, with him on LinkedIn. She sent, he sent a message into there because they're doing an RFP right now for basically for, for technology companies. So basically by networking and talking, this building a relationship with somebody that it's not in my core industry exactly was able to turn that. And we were able to get, get the sale. We use audit, you know, uh, through, through the, went through our, our standard process. Um, but I just wanted to just to kind of say when you're when you're marketing and you're, when you're selling and when you know you want to build relationships first, and you never know where they're gonna where they're gonna lead or or, or who they're gonna know. So I also told that to my sales staff and my marketing staff. So don't don't you know just just build relationships and then you may they may know somebody. You don't know who that they you don't know who those people know. So it's important to build a relationship first and uh, and go from there. So that's awesome, Frank. So we closed a uh, $15,000 a month MRR deal in December and uh, a $17,000 a month deal in January. And like one thing I kind of proved was that even the larger companies don't care about these big proposals or tons and tons of tech data. Like I think that there's a misconception amongst MSPs that like you can close small deals with like by by using a tool like audit and and making it easy for them to understand it but if you want the bigger ones you really gotta you know start shoveling and get the data and come in with reports and all this other stuff and uh you know for me it was just validation that it's, it's not necessary i gave neither of those companies a, a formal proposal with line items and parts and all that stuff um it was all based on you know gap analysis and a presentation of audit um telling them what the what the cost was you know or the price in the uh in the audit report so they you know what the bottom line was going to be we uh, we did a demo of our platform and you know we closed both of them pretty easily and, and both of those by the way tim were via zoom um okay. so yeah just to just to kind of loop back to that one so those are some good wins for us you know we are we are going after the larger customers now that if, if we can if we find it's almost as much work as the smaller ones, but they're just way more profitable and there's more opportunity there. Um, so just, you know, I guess, you know, what we learned, what I proved is that the, the tool works uh, really well, no matter what size it is. Like we're dealing with people on the other end of this. And it doesn't matter if behind the people you're selling to, there's a hundred endpoints or 10 endpoints. Um, so I think, uh, you know, it work, the, the concept works really well. Yeah, and I, I've gotten to see Frank over. You know, I've known you for a long time and been working with you for a long time. And I've, I've, it's pretty extraordinary how much your price. You know, the the MRR deals have gone up and up and up each time I talk to you. It seems like you're setting a, a new record. <laughs> so, uh, Brian. Yeah, I, I would uh, I would share a story about a current client that we had uh, that we just converted to to uh, a managed plan. They were kind of on a hybrid. They had some of our services a la carte, but we had approached them about getting on a, a fully managed plan and uh, probably two years ago and really couldn't couldn't get them to, to get engaged. And I guess they just didn't feel like we hadn't had any problems. So why should we, you know, take a look at that? And uh, right in the middle of tax season, uh, they got hijacked where uh, cyber criminals were filing taxes under their name. And when they would go to file a client's tax, uh, uh, they couldn't because it would say that it had already been filed. So they obviously uh, had some malware, malware that had uh, been downloaded in there. And so we were able to go in there again with the tool 
the audit tool and show them probably how it happened and why it happened. Um, and to let them know that, that there were all of these uh, layers of security that weren't currently in place that are available to them that would ensure that that, that probably the, the risk would go down, you know, 80, 90 percent from what they were exposed to. And it was pretty eye opening. And it, it's probably one that everybody on this call has had where they said, well, I thought you were doing all this for us already. And, uh, you know, I kind of said, well, you're an accountant. You know, do you offer services for free? And they're like, no. So so, I mean, you, you get what you pay for. Essentially, I didn't tell them exactly like that, but. Uh, it was it was real eye opening to be able to expose him to the risks that he had and for us to be able to show him that we had a solution and uh, we were able to close it pretty much that day right on the spot. So it, it was a great win for us, for our current client that we made a, a, a very happy client. That's awesome. I do have a question uh, that came to me here from an actual audit user. So this is an audit specific question. Um, best practices on the de actual delivery of the audit report to a prospect. So looking for looking for best practices to the actual delivery of the audit report to a prospect. And maybe why don't we mix it up a little bit? And I'll start with Frank because Frank actually founded audit and then we'll work uh, around. The, I'll figure out how to go back <laughs> around the horn. Yeah. So I think we touched upon it. Um, you know, my, my first meeting is all about discovery. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't, I personally don't run uh, data collection tools. We frame uh, the conversation around that, you know, we're there to understand the business problems first. And depending on what they are, we may or may not need to take a deeper dive. However, this is a high level audit. I usually frame it as a 27 or a 36 point audit. Um, I usually kid around and say it's not a 2000 point audit that comes after you're our client and we deploy the rest of our, our our software kit where we can then start to gather other information i said you know we just couldn't get forensic enough and, and we both usually agree at that moment yeah no that's not what we want here what we want is a high level to understand uh, where we are today um so that second meeting um at, at the end of the first meeting you should be at a point where that prospect is begging you for a solution like they should be right there with you understanding that they've got problems um, you're not there to, to 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 start pitching products and services like a lot of the vendors sort of tee us up for with the battle cards so by um before we leave i set up uh meeting number two that's the one in our office and for us um you know we bind we spent like a couple hundred dollars on a binding machine we bind the audit reports up i want it to look like you know it's like my senior year term paper i spent you know like the whole semester or whatever it was year doing right this was not not some you know thing i winged the night before and threw a staple in and it's all dog-eared and you know i want this thing to look professional so we'll spend a couple dollars and you know make sure that we have enough copies for each person no proposals i have a proposal because i may need to refer to a number if a question comes up but they're definitely not getting them or leaving with the proposal um you know and for us it has always been about um, just a professional image of it. You know, we have, we have folders that we have with our logo and, you know, just everything has to be congruent for us. And, you know, and I, I don't wear logoed shirts, you know, I want to look like the business owner, not the technician. So I wear, you know, I always, always wear, you know, a sport jacket and, you know, I don't wear ties anymore because I think then it make people feel uncomfortable, but, you know, I, I want to just dress professionally and I, that's how I do the presentation. Um, and then, you know, if they, they don't make a decision, then they leave with that audit report. Um, never the proposal. Cool. Tim, let's go to, I'm going to go across the, uh, the pain. Sure. So, you know, I frame it, you know, typically we're going to do a 27, you know, point audit um, of your network. We don't have enough time to really go into, we don't deploy any, any tools, anything like that, similar to Frank. And sometimes I'll bring a, you know, if I'm there, we'll, sh we'll show a sample of the report. It's going to look something like this with, I explain it's red, yellow, and green. So it's a lot different than any other report you're going to get from a different provider. So I say it's a unique, we have a unique process and procedure on how, on how we do that. And then we'll present that either via zoom or, or in person as part of um, kind of our first, our first findings, you know, and one of the things I try to make sure when it comes back from the engineer, I review most audits um, that they, they prepare now the, the salesperson and the engineer prepare it. But if I see a sea of red, 
I say we, we can't have a sea of red. We have to find some things that are good when it really they're very we have a very high level of cybersecurity and technology here. But when we're, when we're going through the selling process, we need to make sure that, you know, it's an accurate statement of what's there. But if we have a lot of red, too, it's hard to sell to a com- customer who can't, can't say everything's wrong. You have to find some things that are positive. And we take note of those red, red items and we'll address them right away uh, at, a, at, a, at a further discussion. Um, but that's really the, the big thing that um, that, that we, we kind of position as, as a unique okay. process. And it's very high level and easy to use because sometimes we're not selling to the end user. Like sometimes we're, we're dealing with sometimes IT directors now and we have to pitch ourselves to them. And then actually the either the, the board or there are other people that are actually making the decision. So we have that audit paired with a PowerPoint presentation at a very high level. And we give them, these are the two pieces you need to present because I'm not sure how they're going to pair us and things like that. We try to build a good relationship with that IT director and that's like how, how, how that person's going to actually um, present it as well. But that's how that's how we do it as, as part of our process. Once our, our fact finding is done and, and everything like that. So cool. How about you, Brian? Um, so, you know, one of the things that you've talked about is Zoom. I, I like to do my appointments in person and I've been in sales for a long time and I think body language is a, is a, a great indicator of, of how you're doing and, and how they're comprehending. So I always like to do it in person. Um, and, and they've already kind of discussed the, the red, yellow, and the green. One of the things that's been a, a, a big benefit for, for us is an enhancement to audit of the M- business impact statement. So we'll go through each of those reds and yellows. We don't really touch on the greens too much. But we'll tell them, you know, this is an area that that uh, needs to be addressed, why it needs to be addressed, and either the impact of not addressing what what could mean to your business if you don't address it, or here's what you're going to get if you make this change and, and implement this solution, this part of the solution. And um, so it's the, the business impact uh, statement is a game changer because it's in the audit and Although I don't really review those, they're listed in, in as part of the audit. I go through them when we're going through each category, but it's there for them to review because, as Tim said, a lot of times we'll present to people who are not the final decision maker. So the, the easier I can make it for them to explain it to, to their boss or to the owner, the better the chances that we're going to be able to convert them to a, a managed plan. Cool. And David? I feel like I'm politicking now because I'm just going to repeat what everybody else has already said. The brilliant solutions, right? So, um, yeah, to to Tim's point, I think that it's important to add credibility, right? If you go in with with too much neutral and negative and you you don't highlight anything good, it it almost destroys it. They they kind of expect you to come in with with the negative, right? So it almost disrupts the the thought pattern a little bit by pointing out some things that are positive. Um, And, you know, I think the D... The, t- the detail of putting it together correctly and the professionalism like really bodes well for people when they are trying to make a decision on who they want to go with. Right. So they, they believe that I think the presentation is is so key. And so we we're very, very similar in the, pro- the approach that, that we take. Um, you know, I, I guess maybe I'll, I'll spin it around to a question for the group. Like one of the things we were challenged with at the beginning of using the tool was wanting to get too deep into the minutia of the reds and it started to expand the conversation where it was taking too long. So it may be of benefit to all of us and um, to the listeners to understand like, how, how do you guys fend against that and like the actual presentation of the findings uh, to keep it, you know, high enough level where the conversation keeps moving forward, but detailed enough that it, it presents the impact that, that you're looking for. So what I kind of say on there, like sometimes there'll be maybe three, two or three red boxes but I have one solution that will actually turn them into green. So I kind of say, look, there's a lot of red here, um, but we have solutions that can can basically turn these red boxes into greens relatively easy. So don't be concerned. This is going to be out of your budget or out of your scope. I understand you're a small and medium sized business and you have a finite budget, but we want to be we want to basically uh, give you the best bang for your buck on anything that we're that we're doing. We want to provide value to you. That's kind of what I say when there's when there's a, a lot of um, a lot of red that has to be has to be dealt with, so they understand they're not like oh my god what am I going to need to do to get this all fixed? Right. Just kind of put them at a little little at ease, you know. Okay. The other angle of audit too is um, is uh, 
where we talk about driving the wedge, right? Because our best prospects are another MSP's customer. And, um, you know, that red festers, uh, when they see red and yellow and they take that report back, they go back to their current MSP and say like, what the heck, you know, we're not, we're not using a zero trust policy product, or we're not using, you know, next gen AV, or we're not doing security awareness training. And, um, what's funny is a lot of times when we actually win these deals, the outgoing MSP who, you know, we have to have some interaction with usually will the parting shot isn't something mean. It's just, I don't know how you guys have to buy all that stuff. They'd never buy it from us. And what I really find is, is it was all about that discovery and showing them what they didn't know. And if they had, if they hadn't had that, that um, assessment done by us, which is usually the product of marketing that we've done, right? It was the offer. Hey, well, well let's come in and see if your current MSP is doing an awesome job. Um, then they would never would have known what they didn't know. And so, you know, I, that's what I found, um, is that I don't mind all the, the red and yellow there. And, you know, I figure even if I'm, I even tell the prospect, I said, listen, even if we're off, like maybe I didn't think you were doing DNS filtering and you are, it's, I, you now understand what it is and your current MSP can confirm with you. You know, I'd love it. I'd love to find out that I thought you weren't doing it. You were, but usually we, it's not the case, right? We usually find out that the stuff that I told them about wasn't what they were doing. And so that overshadows all the technical yeah, minutia for me. Like they don't care as much if like 30 of the MS, of the workstations were running short on, you know, disk space, right? What they care about is all these big things that I told them about that they had no idea that weren't covered. So that's, that's what I find. Very interesting. Anybody else have anything? Well, you know, I would say one of the things that's helpful as well as you go through, you know, areas that maybe they they are not covered in is is to to try to tell a story that that relates to that particular issue, whether it's cybersecurity training uh, um, or multi-factor, you know, tell a tell a horror story and it kind of helps really drive it home of how critical it is that, that they address that issue. Uh, because people relate to stories, right? Uh, rather than going, you, you need this. We won't, we won't, we won't, uh, bring you on unless you have this. Well, that doesn't tell them a why it's important. So by telling them how somebody else suffered, maybe I can save you some pain. Awesome. I have a question for all of you guys as, as kind of a follow-up to this. So I know we're coming up on, on time, but do you find, you know, in the process of doing your fact finding, you're having conversations with them. They rec they know they have a problem already, right? Or they wouldn't have invited you in. Um, are you giving them feedback as you're going? And if somebody tells you we don't have this thing, right? And you're 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 explaining to them maybe, well, that's why you're having this problem that you called us for. Are they surprised when they see that? report you know when you come in if it's all red yellow green and, and just shocking to them are they surprised by that or do you find that they kind of like okay i you're showing me something i kind of expected and i'll start with whoever i don't know if you all have an answer for it but whoever wants to chime in on that how about you brian you go first really yeah, yeah I, I would just say that that there there is a tendency that when you spot an area that that they're not being covered that you just want to tell them how important it is and and i think the discovery should be all about gathering data and understanding their business and by doing that i mean you say we're going to analyze what we've got here and we're going to be able to present it back to you in a form that'll make sense to you and help explain why it's important what you don't have rather than me kind of the tendency is to try to oh it's a problem let me tell you how i'm going to solve it without kind of going through the sales process so kind of slow your roll is what mm -hmm. i would say yeah we what we do is we bring our sales engineer in to collect the data and he'll be his his job is to collect information not to not to sell anything if the prospect does ask sometimes there's just a more technical person he'll he'll just ask a question why are we getting this information kind of why it's important but but he says it's important we're going to take all this information back sit down uh, with the client relationship manager, uh, myself, and to to kind of review all the data to present a, a finding because you don't want to. We want to see the whole entire picture before we provide just one little one little piece. We need to see everything in order to do that. So that's how we usually do that. Meanwhile, that sales engineer is building credibility 
you know, as a as a technician of PCH technologies and understanding, you know, what's what, what to look for. Yeah, I'll hop in and say that uh, we talk a lot about we know how the story ends, right? So it's it's our process, and we know what the deliverables look like, and most of the time the prospect really doesn't. And so um, we tend to ask that question on the front end. Right. So we, we know that there's a scoring piece as well as not just a color coding piece. Right. So there's a numeric value that we attach to each one of those three or four sections. And I always like to ask that question just for a level of perspective. Like, do how how well do you think you've got this locked down? And look, we're going to find we're going to find. Right. The number is going to be what the number is going to be. Um, and sometimes it's just fun. And But but going into it, you understand, like how you need to present and position this because they may have a panic attack if they think they've got this on lockdown. And you find quite the difference, or they may be pleasantly surprised they're not as bad as they thought they were, right? And um, so one of the things that we've also started to do, I don't know if anybody else is doing this, is we log the results based on vertical industry. So we can start to talk to them about, like, typically when we go into these things in the nonprofit yeah, space, know. you're here, like, sometimes that softens us a, a little bit, like nobody wants to be a 42 or a 37. But if you say, yeah, you know, it's pretty, we, we call that normal, right? And so, but here's where we can take you to, right? It's, uh, they don't feel like such a, an outcast, because I think in a lot of cases, they may internalize it as a leader to say, wow, how did this happen under my watch? Right? I, I thought, we, right. I thought we were in good shape. I've been telling the board that, you know, we're, we're, we're button down tight, and you're telling me something quite different. Uh, so that's, that's a couple of things that, that we do, but we don't, we don't try and solve along the way. I think it, it pulls the carpet out from underneath the the end product, which is that presentation. Yeah, I think, Mike, it depends where the um, prospect came from. So if it's a result of uh, marketing that we've done, I often find they are surprised by the red and yellow. Um, if it's a referral or someone who, you know, kind of came looking and sought us out, like on our website or Google, um, they're usually like, wow, yeah, this is what we thought. And so we're just validating and again, this is where I, I say, you know what, like the, the customer knows there's a problem. They just don't know how to articulate it because this is technology and it's super confusing to them, right? Because they're not tech tech people, right? So if you listen to them and you show them the audit report, what you've done is you calm them down and you help validate that there's problems, right? But you help show them both qualitative and quantitatively what the, how, what it looks like, right? And now we're able to easily show them the, the solution in a way where they can compare one state to the other and it, and it just makes the sale flow naturally i mean it, that, that's what i love about it but, but i but i find that if, if they came looking they usually know that there's an issue out there cool well guys we're coming up on about 45 minutes um i want to first i'm going to i'm going to ask you all a final question <clears throat> and i'll start with david tim Frank, and then we'll go with brian because you guys i know david and tim both have appointments at the top of the hour so in case you have to jump off um, I want to thank you guys for being on here. Um, I'm going to throw up on the screen um, how how you can get in touch with uh, learning more about audit because that question did come in on a comment. So I'll pop up a, a URL. You, you just go to I mean, go to auditforit.com and just actually click on the book a demo button. That is the best way to learn about the tool. Uh, but I'm going to ask ask you guys to each kind of talk about as we as we wrap up here um, what either big opportunities do you, are you seeing out there right now or what challenges are you seeing that we that you're that you're working towards overcoming and we'll start with david uh I'll, I'll stay positive above the line right so i'll go with opportunities the world's our oyster uh and i, I mentioned it earlier it's the um i feel like the insurance industry on the cyber side is starting to catch up with just not writing willy-nilly policies and so those of us who have products and services that are wrapped around that uh, are in a relatively good position to capitalize on it. I think it's it's really starting to um, be beneficial uh, for all of us. So if you don't have that, get, get, get in on it while you can. Cool. Yeah, I, I would echo that. Um, the cyber liability insurance is definitely um, driving our sales. We had one client that um, they, they basically, they came to us, they had to be you know, compliant in like 25 days. I said, well, you could ask them for a 30 day extension, typically a long term process. Oh, we already did that. We have 25 days. So they're going to drop us. So then we put us in a position to that we had to, you know, execute and, and get them done. I said, you know, we, we can take care of this for you. But I think that's one area. The other one we see is um, really around compliance, uh, CM, CMMC compliance and how how your services will, will, will basically fulfill some of those things. Uh, you know, we're not in HIPAA. Um, you know, we have a lot of 
companies that do business with the government, um, with the manufacturing sector, and they're basically being subject to some of the, those compliances. So that's the compliances and the cyber liability insurance is driving. Um, before they, they could say, oh, we don't really need that, Tim, but now they have to have it. It's not a, it's not a question. Um, and it's and it's and it's it's proven it's proven that 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 it's needed. So that's how we're that's how we see that's how we're growing, and we see it continuing to grow in the future. Yeah, I see two things too. So uh, one is we're getting a lot of uh, referrals um, and and companies reaching out to us where they've had an internal IT guy for a long time, um, and that guy's looking to retire. And that guy kind of kept things running internally for them, but also held them back from a technology perspective. And so it, the timing is perfect because this guy wants to leave gracefully. The company wants to modernize the tech and we pick up the managed services that's equal to or maybe sometimes less than what they were spending in salary and fringes on that guy. So, you know, these are like good, like five to $10,000 a month, you know, deals that are just right for us to go in and, and really modernize. The other one is around PCI compliance. I think that's one of the most overlooked compliance angles of the compliance categories. Quite simply, what I found was that more and more of my customers started taking um, payments um, during the pandemic. And I got brought into a PCI compliance audit. We had no visibility into like what was happening, but the, but the thought was, was that we, because we were the MSP, had all this handled. So now we're, you know, taking a, a, a harder look at, you know, at what our customers are doing from a payment standpoint, making sure that we cover our bases because we're not secure if they're not secure is basically what it comes down to. No different than, you know, like and everything else we sell, right? So we don't want to leave gaps out there. So those are the two that, that I see uh, a lot of. Cool. And Brian? Uh, I, I would tell you that I'm, we're seeing uh, some significant opportunity with co-managed uh, you know, services. I, I think typically for me as the account executive, I've tended to kind of walk on by those types of accounts when I've engaged them and they say we already have somebody internally that handles that for us because as we all know on this call, there, there's a lot of services that are just not available to, you know, an internal guy. Um, and he goes on vacation at some point. So, we came up with a, a specific plan for those types of clients where we could support that internal person uh, for a fraction of what it would cost to bring an additional person on board. And it's allowed us to approach, you know, some clients that, that traditionally were out of our sweet spot of, you know, 10 to 50 employees. So now we we're able to approach people with 200 employees that maybe have a person on site and we can help support that with the services. So, I think I think that that's going to continue to grow is the co-managed. Awesome. Well, guys, thank you all so much for being here. Um, again, I'm going to put up uh, this link here. So if you're listening to it uh, on the recording here, we were talking about audit a lot and did get a couple questions about people asking what they can do to learn more about audit. You can go to auditforit.com and and you can download a sample report from that page. But if you put uh, Book a demo on the end of that. So auditforit.com slash book a demo. That will get you to our demo signup page and you can uh, come on and learn more about it. Uh, David, Tim, Brian, Frank, thank you so much for your time. And uh, everybody listening, keep on elevating IT until we meet again. Thanks, everybody. Thanks guys.